Hello, everybody. Welcome to worship today as we gather around the Word of God. We are at Trinity Lutheran Church in Litchfield Park, Arizona. We are getting ready to celebrate the Lutheran Reformation in a few weeks. And so in preparation, we've been looking at key dates in the Lutheran Reformation history. And today we're going to take another look at um, a date. It's 1580. AD. And the importance of this date is that this is the year where the, the Lutheran reformers gathered together all their confessional writings, the things that we believe, teach, and confess as Lutheran Christians, and they put them together in a book called the Book of Concord, and that's considered our Lutheran confessions, the things that we proclaim to the world that we believe um, as conservative Lutheran Christians. And so today we're gonna to take a look at 1580, a little, of the, a little bit of the history around that and what it means for us today. Um, it's a good day to be in God's house. We're glad that you're here. We'll see you in worship in just a minute. God's word is our great heritage and shall be ours forever to spread its light from age to age shall be our chief end. Through life it guides our way, in death it is our stay, Lord grant while worlds endure we keep its teachings pure throughout all gems. We gather for worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today is from Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Our second scripture lesson is from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at the fourth verse. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And our gospel lesson for today is from John chapter 17, beginning at the 20th verse. Jesus said, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of our God. We now join together in the words of the Nicene Creed as we confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your son and to destroy what he has done. Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your Christendom that we may sing your praise eternally. O oh, Comforter, Priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life.
are steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your Son and to destroy what he has done. Martin Luther died in 1546. Almost immediately, there were fractures in the Reformation movement. Luther was a giant during his time, but there was no successor after him, and the void was too much. Some of the leaders lost their confidence since Luther had died. Some were worried about social unrest, people misunderstanding what the Reformation was all about. And others, they feared the Roman Emperor and the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Emperor Charles V reached out to the Lutherans with a compromise called the Augsburg Interim. His goal was to restore peace in his empire. Some of the reformers joined the cause, but most did not. The Augsburg Interim was essentially a Roman Catholic document that compromised the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was unacceptable to most of the reformers. During this time also, Several errant teachers arose amongst the ranks of the Reformation. There was controversy over doctrines such as Christ himself, good works, original sin, election, adiaphora, and even justification by faith. <coughs> it was during this time also that new reformers arose who did not believe that Luther went far enough. And several groups of Protestants started up. The years after Luther's death were chaotic. Under the name of the Reformation, all kinds of people rose up to champion their own causes and to break away from the Roman Catholic Church. There were those who wanted a Christian utopia. There were those who wanted to completely separate themselves from the world. There were those who wanted to do exactly opposite whatever the Roman Catholic Church did. There were those who used the church and the Reformation to promote their own personal agendas. The Reformation movement was splintering. It was a chaotic time after Luther's death. It was tumultuous. Satan was having a heyday with all of these controversies. And the people, they were confused. And the gospel was at risk all over again. That's where the year 1580 A.D. becomes important. 1580 A.D. is when the Lutherans formulated all of their doctrines into one book called the Book of Concord. The Book of Concord confessed the truths of Holy Scripture. The Book of Concord contains the doctrines that we believe, teach, and confess as conservative Lutheran Christians. True Lutherans rallied around the Book of Concord in 1580 AD because it faithfully confessed the teachings of Christ. The Book of Concord brought peace and unity to the Lutheran part of the Reformation. It was the final dividing line 
between those who confessed Lutheran doctrine and those who did not. Even today, here at Trinity, the official constitution of our church references the Book of Concord. Here's what our constitution says. It's um, in Article 3, it's under the Confession of Faith. This congregation acknowledges and accepts all the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments without reservation and acknowledges and accepts all the symbolic books of the Evangelical Lutheran Church contained in the Book of Concord of 1580 to be the true exposition of the doctrines of Holy Scriptures. And then it goes on to say, All doctrines shall be taught and examined in this congregation according to these scriptural and confessional norms, and all doctrinal controversies which arise in this congregation shall be decided and uh, adjudicated on the basis of them. Our own constitution here at Trinity even references the Book of Concord in 1580. The Book of Concord is the official and the public confession of the Lutheran Church. The Book of Concord has gathered together all the doctrines of Holy Scripture that we believe, teach, and confess. It is available for everyone to see and study and learn from. The Book of Concord is frequently referred to simply as the Concordia. That's a Latin word that means agreement and unity and harmony. The Book of Concord brought Concordia to the Lutheran Reformation. Concordia, this agreement and union and harmony that we have in the faith, the teachings of Christ and the doctrines of Scripture, that's God's work amongst us. God's will is that we have concordia, peace and unity and harmony around scriptures. God's will is that we have concordia with each other as Lutheran Christians. This concordia, peace and union, agreement, harmony, this concordia, it's, it's not peace and unity, though, like the world thinks. It's peace and unity around Jesus Christ, the Savior God sent for us, the Son of God, whose life, death, and resurrection saves us from our sins. His work rescues us and brings us into concordia with God himself. We have unity and peace with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now because of that, we have concordia around his word, around the teachings of Christ. St. Paul describes concordia like this. We heard this today in our scripture lesson. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called into one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's St. Paul's way of describing the unity we have in Christ, or as we would say today, the concordia that we have in Christ. That unity of the Spirit, that bond of peace, that's concordia, peace and unity around the Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings of his word. Jesus prayed for this kind of concordia as well. We heard it today in our gospel lesson from John 17. Jesus said, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Jesus prays for concordia, in his church, for peace and unity, harmony, agreement 
around Christ and his holy word, the teachings of scripture. There is concordia in the true Christian church. Remember when you think about the doctrine of the church, you could, are to think about it in two different ways. In, a, in a, um, a wide sense, the holy Christian church is all believers of all times and in all places. In a more narrow sense, probably the way that we usually think about it, it's local congregations or churches. In the wide sense, the holy Christian church is all believers of all times and in all places. Only the Lord knows truly who is a believer in Christ or not. So this church is invisible. It's known only to God. It's the true believers in Christ of all times and all places. The holy Christian church, all believers of all times and all places, is united through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is true concordia in the holy Christian church. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace around Holy Scripture. This is the church that we confess in the Nicene Creed when we say that we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. This church is all believers of all times and in all places. And you are included through faith in the Jesus Christ. It's invisible. God only knows who the true believers are. But there is concordia in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. The other way to think about the doctrine of the church is the visible church. And these are the local congregations, gatherings of believers in one place around a confession of faith. In local congregations, People join churches for a lot of different reasons, and it's not always because they believe in Jesus. You never know. But Jesus teaches us that, um, that there are believers and unbelievers mixed together during um, our lifetimes. This is the Lutheran church is one of those local congregations that, that gather around the teachings of Holy Scripture as confessed in the Book of Concord. In a local congregation, and na nationwide, like in our church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, it means that we hold to the same understandings and of the teachings of Scripture, that we believe, teach, and confess the same things, that we have peace and unity, that we have concordia around the doctrines of Christ, such as who he is and what he has done for us, the doctrines of the Holy Trinity, the doctrine of sin and grace and faith, doctrines of baptism and communion, even Holy Scripture itself, that there's a unity around these teachings. And when you go to other conservative Lutheran congregations, you will be hearing the same thing because we're, we have concordia. There's peace and unity, agreement, in these doctrines. That's what 1580 is all about. The, the reformers brought together all these documents to find that concordia in the Book of Concord. But inside the church, there's a danger. Inside the Christian church, there is a false teaching about the unity of the church. It's called ecumenicalism. And it's the idea that all Christians should unite regardless of what you believe about Christ and his word. They think that if you love Jesus, that's enough. Don't tell me anymore. If you love Jesus, that's enough. Some groups say, if you have faith, that's enough. Don't tell me anymore. We have unity because you are a person of faith. This, the, the truths of Scripture and the doctrines of Christ are considered minor. They're secondary in nature. They even say that they are divisive, that if you take a stand on the Word of God, you are dividing the church instead of uniting the church. For them, it doesn't really matter what you believe. If you consider yourself a believer, that's good enough. 
doesn't matter what you believe in. doesn't matter what your faith is in. They just want the unity. They want the, the, to come together um, aspect and the community. They believe that that's what's important, that we unite as Christians regardless of what one believes. It's called ecumenicalism. As conservative Lutheran Christians, we can have nothing whatsoever to do with that. And that's because Jesus has taught us, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. The Book of Concord of 1580 holds to the teachings of Christ. Concordia happens, peace and unity it only happens when you hold on to the doctrines of Scripture. The teachings of Christ are the most important thing. There is no compromise with the truth of Holy Scripture. We cannot be a part of these ecumenical movements and um, activities that deny the truth of Christ and his Holy Word for the sake of unity. So like the apostles of old, and like our Lutheran ancestors of fifth, in the 1500s, we will hold to the teachings of Christ. That's conservative Lutheranism. We will faithfully confess the truth of God's holy word. And one of the places where we do that is in the Book of Concord of 1580. We will diligently guard and protect the truth of God's holy word from false teachers and worldly ideas like we do in the book of Concord. And we will grow and we will learn the truths of God's holy word as they're confessed in the book of Concord. 1580 AD, it's an important date for us as Lutheran Christians it separated the Lutherans from all the other Protestants. It marked the creation of the Book of Concord, the official teachings and confessions of the Lutheran Church. It contains what we believe, teach, and confess as conservative Lutheran Christians. 1580 AD. It teaches us that the teachings of Christ really do matter. And that true concordia happens only around Christ and his holy word. Amen. We pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for unity in the Holy Christian Church. Open the ears of believers so that they may hear your true word and the gospel good news of your eternal salvation. Lead them to repent of their sin and turn away from striving to please you with their own works and efforts. Create faith in the gospel and sanctify them by your spirit. Cast out false teachers and raise up faithful pastors and teachers for us and for the ages to come. We pray this knowing that you are the Lord of the church Amen. We join together now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week in worship. Jesus, follow his 
example pure flee the world which would deceive us and to sin our souls allure ever in his footsteps treading body here yet soul above full of faith and hope and love let us do So die with Jesus, his death from the second death. From our soul's destruction, he frees us, quickens us with life's glad breath. Let us mortify while living flesh and blood and die to sin. And the grave that shuts us in Shall but prove the gate to heaven Jesus, here I die to thee There to live eternally Let us gladly live with Jesus Since he's risen from the dead Death and grave must soon release us Jesus, thou art now our head We are truly thine own members Where thou livest, there live we Take and own us constantly Faithful friend as thy dear brethren Jesus, here I live to thee Also there 